So uh, welcome everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our second installment of our Spark from Inspiration to Creation Lecture Series. I'm Kate Swanson, Interpretation and Public Engagement Educator at the Rockwell Museum. And as we know, with a new year and new lecture series comes a new Rockwell theme to unite our programs and exhibitions. This year, we're considering how individual perspectives, unexpected sources, and lived experiences inform the artistic process. Throughout the year, we'll present journeys that move from inspiration to creation. Our focus today comes from um, environmental events and the inspiration that those can have as our speakers honor the 50th anniversary of the devastation caused by Hurricane Agnes in the southern tier of New York. In considering our environment, I'd like to take a moment here to pause and acknowledge that the land that the Rockwell Museum occupies is home to the Seneca people of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. At the Rockwell, we've been talking about when and how to respectfully use land acknowledgements, and we invite you to learn more about our actionable steps towards working with our Indigenous communities by referring you to the land acknowledgement page of our website, which we are linking for you in the chat. We are really fortunate to have two people who are very familiar with the event of Hurricane Agnes with us tonight to take us through how Hurricane Agnes helped to reshape Corning specifically. And I'm gonna introduce them to you right now. <laughs> Brian Frey is the Director of Operations and Special Projects for WSKG Public Media in New York's Southern Tier and Finger Lakes regions. He is also an Emmy Award-winning documentary filmmaker with over 25 films to his credit, several of which have aired nationally on PBS. Along with his film about the 1972 flood, Brian has produced documentaries about early aviator Glenn Curtis, which won the New York State Emmy Award for Best Documentary in 2005, and films titled Harvest, Main Street Rising, Watkins Glen, The Street Years, and Cornell, Birth of the American University. He's currently working on a film about the Underground Railroad in upstate New York, which I am looking forward to. Rob Gassetti is the retired senior director of creative strategy and visitor engagement at the Corning Museum of Glass. He joined the Corning Museum of Glass in 1999 as manager of education and creative services and was named senior director in 2007. In 2005, Rob was asked to explore the next phase of expansion for the museum and the new contemporary art and design wing of the museum based on his master plan opened in 2015. His work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times and Architectural Record. He's spoken widely on museum planning and glass technology. Today, Rob serves as president of the Board of Trustees for the Museum Association of New York and a member of the Corning Incorporated Architectural Advisory Committee. Thank you so much. And with that, we're gonna get into our conversation. FYI, as you settle in, we're a little bit longer than, um, our typical one hour format today to save time for those good questions towards the end. Um, so we'll be here till seven. Brian is gonna set the stage for us by introducing a few clips from the Ag Agnes documentary. And then I'll be asking the presenters a few questions to help them share more of their knowledge about this historic event. And with that, I turn it over to you two. Well, thank you, Kate. Good evening. I, it's a pleasure to be involved with this and it's a pleasure to share the screen with Rob. Um, I always love talking about this film. Uh, it, it's uh, one of my favorites and it uh, continues to be one of our most popular films that WSKG airs and, and streams. So uh, thank you for having me tonight. And welcome, Rob. It's good to be here. Looking forward to the, the conversation. I think like Kate said, what we're gonna do to start with is we're gonna, during the presentation, we're gonna show some clips from the film. So one of the things that we thought might be a great way to start it, is to show you a clip from early on in the film where it talks about Market Street before the flood and how there was some uh, movement to try to uh, Im improve Market Street even before the flood happened. So I think, uh, Kate, if you want to roll that and we'll chat a little bit about that afterwards. Corning rested just three miles east of Gang Mills and Painted Post. The Shimong River sliced directly through the center of the compact but bustling city. Corning shared with its neighbors the same series of Depression-era levees and dams that they believe protected their city's economic heart along Market Street. It was there, even late into the century, that Corning continued to exhibit the characteristics of its industrial heritage. 
Market Street was a, a really very simple street with uh, a lot of long underwear stores and five and ten cent stores and bars. Uh, it had a great many bars. Market Street in Corning was a kind of dirty, working class, gritty place. There were a lot of bars on Market Street. Even in 1972, people would get out for lunch from the factory. They would actually leave the plant, come out onto Market Street for lunch, and at lunch, they would have beer. I mean, they wouldn't just eat lunch, they would you know, have a couple of beers, and then they'd go back into the plant. And that was just the way life was. But by the summer of 1972, a grassroots movement was already in place to study Market Street's architecture and lay plans for a new life. It was clear that something had to happen with Market Street, that we had all this kind of derelict property on it, and that it was a mess, and there were I think it was about 50% vacant. We wanted it to be pretty. We wanted our kids to grow up so that they could look around and have an appreciation of things that were meaningful and attractive. And we think, thought that the Main Street was meaningful and could be made attractive. That, uh, that clip always cracks me up, the part about the bars. At the, when I started doing the film and I, I worked, you know, collaboratively with, with Connie Sullivan and Bloom, who was wonderful. And this is really a kind of a, this was kind of a collaborative film with uh, the Arts Council at the time. But we always laughed at that comment about how many bars were on <laughs> Market Street at the time. I don't, I don't live in Corning now uh, and never did, but I don't know how many bars are on the street now, Rob. Um, but uh, <laughs> probably not as many as worth it then, I think. Right. I, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the comment rings true. And um, it was, they weren't just drinking beer at, at lunch. Um, I, the, uh, when I first worked in Corning right out of college, uh, this is post flood, of course, um, the, it, you, go, you show up at the bars at 10 o'clock in the morning and that was the end of the first shift. That was the mid, midpoint of the first shift and there'd be a shot and the beer lined up on, along the bar in anticipation uh, of people arriving and they'd sit at the, at the bar and do their shot and beer and then they'd order breakfast. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, you know, it was a, it was a working, uh, working factories, you know, right along the river uh, where today's corporate headquarters are and that basically the entire riverbank was factories and the, and the street along that went along the, uh, there, then Market Street, then it's a, then Denison Parkway where the railroad tracks used to run. So you know that 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 was that was the assortment of uh, activities along the street. Um, it's the it's interesting. It was it's great to see Tom Beekner, who really was the creative force behind um, the, the concept of of saving Market Street. He 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 was the voice to, in in the corporation, uh, Corning Incorporated, to um, and, and at many points a kind of a lone voice to, uh, saying we have got to we've got to do this, and he. In the end, he went down to the mat to, to save the four blocks of Market Street that were saved. Right, and 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 as you know, Tom Tom knew the strength of the street was its its architecture in many ways. It was a, the buildings on the street and still are obviously were were beautiful, though they didn't look. Uh, I don't think they looked really pretty at the time, as Virginia Wright kind of pointed out. They they knew that there was the bones there on Market Street to have a pretty shopping district a pretty main street but uh with all the bars and kind of and as tom mentioned it seemed like he thought at the time maybe uh 50 of the shops were vacant mm -hmm. um, which for, for it, which seemed unusual i remember when i interviewed him and he mentioned that i was uh, surprised by that i um you know part of the the logic in the time at the time this is the time of urban renewal and you know, the, the term of the day was clearing the slums um, to, and, and, uh, and Elmira, which had such an incredibly vibrant downtown, uh, also had a very high uh, vacancy rate. And um, I remember uh, post flood, um, I was, with my dad was an architect and, and one of the uh, jobs they got uh, as part of the urban renewal plan in Elmira is that, any building that was about to be torn down uh, had to be documented, photographed, uh, on the, and they had to survey all of the buildings. And in some cases, we had to draw the facades of the building. So I'm here, here I'm 12 years old, 
working uh, working on this well, probably 14 years old at that time during the time of the uh, tearing all the buildings down. Um, and and just to put it in perspective, um, the the stretch of river front where Riverfront Park is today in in Elmira was was um, according to historic preservation local historic preservation people had the single largest stretch of uninterrupted cast iron facade buildings in um, outside of New York City. So if you think about Soho and the, the way Soho looked and the cast iron facades in Soho, all of those buildings were thrown down to, um, uh, to, to build that park. Why were those buildings torn down? Um, a, a local, uh, a, a, a highly placed local uh, individual, uh, as I was photographing the, one of those buildings said, um, that's, I asked him, why are you tearing this beautiful building down? And it says, to increase the value of the remaining real estate mm. because of the, the vacancy rates. Um, right. Fewer buildings, more, you know, higher percentage of, of occupancy. So a very, um, it, it wasn't just a lay down to say, let's save this, um, this four block stretch of Market Street. Uh, it was, uh, the, the wind was blowing in quite the opposite direction in 1972. Right, uh, you you raise a, a really good point, and that was actually when I started doing the research for the film. That was the you know I always try to find a story about how an event or a person changed or had an impact on um, on the area or on the event that that you know helps shape the story. And and urban renewal it was at the core of the story because a lot of communities uh, through, throughout New York, uh, including Binghamton, uh, Buffalo, Utica were being devastated in many ways by some of the urban renewal uh, theories of tearing down buildings um, and creating this empty space that hopefully somebody would come in and develop. Um, Binghamton, I know, which is my hometown, lost a beautiful, beautiful theater, the Capitol Theater that was on Exchange Street that was torn down in the mid 60s, um, where uh, in Syracuse, their landmark theater was very similar theater, which is now one of the the prettiest theaters in upstate New York. And so there was that theory at the time that uh, tearing down these old buildings was the way to go to create development space. And, and that's what after the flood um, and before it, both Elmira and Corning faced. And that's that's what created uh, the backdrop and kind of the bones for, for my story. It was um, how communities uh, afterwards, after the flood met this challenge, but how the theories of urban renewal also influenced them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, they, and in Corning, the um, Corning uh, had a very active, Corning Incorporated had a very active corporate architecture department with architects on staff. And, um, and the, um, there was a um, tremendous amount of work being done to reimagine what downtown Corning could be someday. And, and so the, the work was underway uh, prior to the flood of envisioning a downtown Corning that was of modern buildings, uh, a pedestrian mall where you could shop along, um, uh, mixed use housing. I mean, all, all of the things that uh, comprise a vibrant downtown, but uh, completely rebuilt. And um, if you wanna see what that would have looked like, it's, it's the remaining part of Market Street. Uh, that's the part of the plan that was actually executed, uh, where the Radisson is and City Hall, the library, the housing beyond there, the ice skating rink, um, uh, all of which, at the when it, they all those buildings opened up um, uh, post flood, was very exciting, uh, very modern, very um, you know of the moment, published in architectural magazines, um, but it doesn't. You know, and there's a line, you know, you can stand and look uh, look to the west and you see Market Street, you look to the east and you see um, state-of-the-art urban renewals work in 1972. And um, and why what happened right there? Well, that's where Dick, where uh, Tom Beekner and his counterpart in corporate architecture, they walked down Market Street and negotiated the line where the where the devast where the devastation, that's, that's my interpretation, would begin, where modern would begin and where 19th century would be saved. And, um, and, and, and to, so you can go stand there yourself and, and, and uh, see the, the poignant difference. Well, I'm curious, Rob, when you came here, um, you must have gotten to know Thomas Beekner. 
And um, did, did he talk about that, that and, and maybe the influence of Marcus Street on the Glass Museum and, and what his, uh, you know, what his vision was at that time? Did he speak about that? Well, he described that moment to me. Um, uh, I, I had the pleasure of knowing Tang uh, as growing up, um, you know, and I, I, I was roughly the same age as, as uh, some of his kids. Um, so, uh, and after college, I, I moved to town um, and Tom was, you know, one of those people who, oh, there's a young designer moving to town and my wife was a designer as well. And we started getting invited to events. And so I, I, I had the pleasure of knowing Tom my entire professional career until, until he passed. Um, he, he talked about it uh, quite passionately, um, the vision of, um, of historic preservation of Market Street began as the film out, uh, states prior to the flood. Uh, there was a, uh, an event uh, called Soundings that was, was first held at the community college and then moved downtown specifically. Uh, and it was a three day event, as, this is a full disclosure for me. So it was a uh, live music, um, uh, 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 cultural experiences, um, all happening simultaneously on Market Street. Abandoned storefronts that were uh, turned into pop-ups uh, for the weekend. Um, all sorts of unexpected things. The street was closed. Um, and, and I must say that I, I, uh, in the year 2000, I came up with uh, 2300 degrees for the Corning Museum of Glass. And it was basically a, a two hour version of soundings. I'm recreating the, the, you know, my childhood um, inspiration from something that was just so powerfully uh, uh, made an impression on me when I was, you know, 12 years old. Yeah, sure. Um, so, and, and, you know, and, and Tom was very much part of, uh, part of that. You know, let's reimagine what downtown is. Let's demonstrate to people what downtown could be. During soundings, the sidewalks of Market Street at the time were, were um, just uh, pavement. They, you know, like street pavement. It wasn't, there weren't, concrete sidewalks um, and um, and they wanted they, had, they were envisioning brick sidewalks and um, uh, tr trees along Market Street and so there were uh, trees in pots that were put out during sounding so people could imagine what that might look like and there was an even a even a public vote of which uh, species of tree should we plant uh, along the along the street so um, Jenny Wright was there. She was interviewed in the in the um, in your film, right. and um, this it just felt so grassroots and so organic and so public. You know, a level of public participation that you know at that time really didn't happen. Uh, sure. And and it, um, I don't know. I would argue that the the spirit of Market Street just you can draw a straight line to that moment. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That was the feeling I got from from Tom too when I interviewed him. Was that uh, they, you know, and that's a, I think that's a bit of a theme in this film is uh, when you're when you're trying to recover from a devastation like this, two things really resonate, and it's vision and leadership. And it was something that that Thomas and others had, and I think that that's one of the things that I I I. I that I would hope people draw from this film. And it's funny you mentioned the soundings because there, is, there was a film crew that came to town to film that and to film just some things uh, around Corning because it was gonna be a, like a, a film about uh, small town USA. And a film crew came to town right before the flood. And a lot of the footage that ends up in this film ended up uh, was because of this film crew that came to town and then they got stuck in town. <laughs> And, you know, and just a couple, you know, just a few days later, essentially, and after the after the it was the weekend um, prior to the flood, soundings took place, and um, they all got they all got they all got stuck, and th and uh, and were able to document it. I know it, and and thankful to me, forty years later, I was able to use their footage to to <laughs> tell this story. So, yeah. I think what we'd like to do is to show the next clip, and this is really kind of the after right after the flood happens in the description of what Corning looked like and Marcus Street looked like then. The city of Corning had been transformed into a surreal junkyard with cars, houses, 
clothing and other debris scattered across lawns and porches. The entire downtown had been inundated. Virtually every business along Market Street had been flooded. Corning Hospital and over a dozen schools in the area were severely damaged. The mammoth furnaces of the glass factory were in ruin. Scores of other industries and shops were turned to rubble. Whole neighborhoods were destroyed, their streets littered with the heartbreaking evidence of devastated lives. Inside the Corning Glass Museum, where the water had risen to over five feet, evidence of the disaster was everywhere. What had happened was that the cases had filled with water. And as they filled with water, the pedestals floated because they were wood and the glasses fell off and filled with water and came down. So you had these glasses all kind of helter skelter. But then as the waters receded, these blocks came down and they were heavy and they crushed the glass. So it was a real, and I think the worst moment for me was going down under the water to try to get some of the rare books out. And of course the rare books were all uh, vellum and, uh, and animal glues and they'd all come apart and they were all slimy and here's Josephus and Agricola and Herodotus and you know, it was terrible. Yeah, it was terrible. I, I remember when I interviewed him, um, you, could, you could just tell that, uh, you know, these 40 years later, it, it still had such an impact on him. Uh, he could, <laughs> he said, it, I remember him saying it was, you know, he could still smell it, um, what it smelled like to, in the heartbreak of going in the museum. I can't imagine. I mean, you, you spent a lot of time in that, in that museum, Rob. Can you imagine that? Well, my goodness. The... Uh, um... The response um, was remarkable in that the museum community, um, you know, around the country and, and even international people came to help with the, uh, the uh, really the reconstruction of the collection uh, that had been damaged. And then, um, and then of course the library, which was the most devastating because the, you know, the those, it's the summertime, those books are wet, they're all gonna get moldy in a heartbeat. And um, there'd been a, uh, a, a flood um, in uh, Florence. Um, I think it was in Florence uh, a number of years, you know, in, in recent memory. And uh, library conservation techniques uh, really were developed then and the, the state of the art was put everything in the freezer, just freeze it wet and to prevent the mold uh, from growing. And, um, and so uh, these freezer trucks, uh, you know, were procured uh, all over the, uh, very rapidly. And, um, you know, and that's how the, most of the library collection was saved uh, by their response. And it was years and years and years of, of work before that, that collection was restored. The most remarkable thing to me was um, uh, the, the response that, that uh, Tom Beekner had, and I'm not sure we're going to see this clip. Are we going to see the clip of him saying it has to be open in a month? I don't think we do, but yeah, but I, <laughs> I remember that was something that was really important to him. Yeah, he said, we're going to be open in a month. It was just inconceivable. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, the National Guard were on, I remember the, my, my, the street I lived down was closed. There was, it, it just, you were on the moon is what it felt like. We're completely isolated. Right. Um, you know, the emergency broad, broadcast radio, uh, curfews, you know, you can't even imagine what if you're going to be able to buy groceries in a month. And he says this museum is going to be open to the public in a month. Yeah. And uh, people just thought he was absolutely nuts. Yeah. But but I, I learned later that this was so much so core to the corning corporate culture. And yet the museum is a separate not-for-profit, but it's generously funded by Corning Incorporated as is the Rockwell. And this, uh, this sense of a, the place in the community 
a symbol of hope yeah. was profound. And, and I saw that demonstrated during my tenure in, uh, at the museum when you know the chips were down and just the communities feeling devastated. Um, in, in, in my case, it was during a huge financial crisis. And, um, and that came through. The, be the symbol of hope in the community and not don't, just don't show that to the community, show that to the world that we're coming back. And, and that's exactly what Tom um, made happen. The sheer force of will and then uh, the Pied Piper, right? Everybody following um, uh, over, over the course of that month. And, and lo and behold, they were, they were open in, um, I think it was August 1 was, the, was in the end was the goal after June 23 to August 1. Yeah, and I think he, I remember him, you know, and that's where that uh, the idea of vision and leadership come in. I mean, because you're right, he, I remember him telling me, he knew that it needed to be a symbol, a symbol for the community of hope. And and he really praised a lot the, the work of, uh, of Amo Houghton and the Absolutely. Houghton family. Um, he, uh, and, and you can't, you can't say enough about what they did in the, there's a, I think I use a little bit of a clip, but I don't think we show it tonight. But there's a clip in the film, an audio clip of a speech, the a radio speech that Amo gives to the community, and you can just tell that it was the type of thing that the community needed to hear at the time that they were going to get through this. and And it's a it's a wonderful clip of audio, and and that's what Tom talked a lot about was just that how the community needed this this leadership because people were, um, and you, you know, remember it was it was like like being on the moon. It was muddy and it was smelly and you felt isolated and I, I interviewed a lot of people who said that they didn't think they would the town would ever come back from this mm -hmm. all the national guard on corners and um it, the picture that first picture in that clip always amazes me of what those cars piled up um and and that's what happened inside the museum i believe was the current of the water is what what did so much damage to the glass and the books and everything and and um and that's uh it's uh it's it's a it's a wonderful story of resiliency and 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 just the right people coming uh to the right place at the right time absolutely so, um the you know meanwhile on market street um the the, the big department store on market street was the rock was rockwell's yeah. And, um, you know, Rockwell's was, was famous because where you, uh, it was an old, old time, you know, um, it just almost like right out of central casting kind of um, Market Street, um, uh, a department store. And the, uh, you know, was, somebody said, you know, you, you're, uh, you're there uh, buying a girdle. <laughs> and you look up and there's this, you know, there's the masterpiece of a painting hanging on the wall of the, of the department store. So the, so Rockwell's was, was, was flooded and, and, um, and that became, there, there was already a, a movement on the ground in terms of what will happen to this amazing painting collection that's in the department store. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and circumstances um, came together. Um, the, um, um, you know, they built a new hotel um, on Market Street, where the Radisson is, the, 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 it's under the Radisson brand today. Uh, well, what happened to the old hotel? That was the Baron Stuben Hotel on, on Market Street. Um, the Market Street Restoration Agency has, had been created. Um, uh, and Brian, you interviewed uh, Norman Mentz. It's, it's a great, it's an amazing story. And um, so on the first floor of the hotel, they, they built an ice cream shop. Let's, let's breathe some life into this in the building that's being abandoned because the new hotel's open. Right. Um, and what goes on the second floor? The, the, a pop-up first home of the Rock Roll Museum. Um, so, you know, you adding cultural vibrancy to a building that in other cities during this period of urban renewal would have been torn down. Um, and then, and, and of course, City Hall follows example um, and, um, and the rest is history. Right. Well, and you mentioned Norman Mintz and that's what, I think we want to talk about next. I think what we'll do is we'll show this uh, last clip that kind of sets up uh, that discussion. In the months and years that followed the disaster, every community in Agnes Path began to move forward. 
In Corning, the movement to resurrect Market Street, already in place before the floods, continued with renewed energy. Many of the buildings throughout the downtown, though badly damaged, were saved and became an integral part of the recovery of the city. The flood of 1972 was a really great example um, of what you can do with historic buildings, even in the face of uh, the terrible conditions that existed after the flood. But people's eyes were on Corning, New York, because this had never really happened before. It's, no one had really thought of preservation as a good tool to economically revitalize a downtown. So people in Corning feel proud of their city. They feel proud that their city was able to recover the way that it did. They also feel very grateful to Corning Incorporated, which at the time was Corning Glass, um, for the support that it gave for the recovery. Yeah, so so Norman Mintz, I'll, I'll tell you a story about when, when I made this film. So Connie and I went down to New York City. Norman had a, uh, his offices were in New York City. And at the same time, we were going to, we interviewed Tommy Hilfiger for, because he, you know, had his, one of his first stores in, um, in, in Elmira at the time. And so we, we, we interviewed Tommy first in his, in his beautiful office. He was so nice to us, gave us really generous, gave us so much time, this beautiful office overlooking uh, Central Park. And, um, and the next day we needed to uh, get some photographs, some family photographs. And so I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Tommy is this huge collector of pop culture. He's written books on it. And, and uh, so he has this, <laughs> this huge warehouse in New York City that has this unbelievable collection of pop culture uh, dresses and other fashion and things like that, as you can imagine. Um, but that's what happened to be where his, his like family uh, album was. So I, that's where we scanned photographs of, of him and his you know, people's place and some of his first things and stuff like that. And very generous. And, and then later that afternoon, we went and interviewed Tom, or, uh, Norman Mintz at his offices. And we interviewed him for like an hour and a half, but it, for, for some reason, and I can't remember why, this is 10 years ago, I couldn't figure out a way to get him into this film. But I thought, how do I, I but the, his story, and he is so dynamic, and it's, it was probably just you know, my inability at the time. I, I knew I wanted to do another film, and years later, I did a film called Main Street Rising, which really tells Norman's story, and is really, in many ways, a sister film to this mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. And, but, and as you can speak to it, Norman, Marcus Street would not look the way it does right now without his influence. And and he just tells great stories. And, and I'll, I'll let you comment a little bit first in your experience with Norman um, and his influence. But then I'll tell a funny story about the trees. OK. Um, so Norman went, went was uh, uh, hired by, um, by Corning Incorporated, uh, then Corning Glassworks, to um, uh, run this little not-for-profit called Market Street Restoration Agency. And, um, and he uh, envisioned and made the uh, restoration of Market Street possible. And, and it's not easy. Remember, these are, these are buildings owned by small business owners. You, you can't just flip the switch and make this happen. Uh, people are, you know, I like my 1970s ugly facade that I put on my building. You know, I don't want to see the brick underneath it. And so this was, this was loan, you know, this was hard work to convince people to do this. And, you know, there was money available, but guess what? That money was available in Elmira. And I remember sitting in meetings with people who said, I don't, I don't want any part of this. I want my building to look exactly the way it does because Parts of, of downtown Elmira, there was money that um, that helped to save buildings as well. Um, so in Norman was a, a, a force of nature. I've never heard anyone talk more loudly on the telephone. It was like, I, I don't have to just hang up to, oh, Norman, I can hear you. I'm, my office is across the street in Market Street. I can hear you just fine. Um, lovely, lovely person. And um, he's driving, uh, a, one little Norman Mint story, he's driving down um, in Addison, which is outside of Corning. 
and um, post flood. And he, he's, he's, he's an architect. And so he's looking at architecture all the time. He looks over and he's admiring this you know, facade of a little uh, building on, on Main Street in Addison. And then he suddenly realizes he like, oh my goodness, he gets a double take. And he's actually realizing he's seeing daylight through the facade of the building. So the only thing left of the building is the facade. And so on the spot, he buys it. And, um, and, and so one of the facades on Market Street is actually, a, you know, in, imported from Addison. Um, and, you know, it's part of the fabric of, uh, of, of the, what, you know, the charm of the street today. Yeah, he, he, you're right. He, right, he is a loud phone talker, but he, um, <laughs> I remember that now, but because we, we actually developed a really fun relationship after the, uh, the Mark or the Main Street Rising film aired, uh, and he came up for the premiere of it, if I remember right, and, um, but he told, tells a great story in that film about the trees and how he, they were kind of setting out on a plan where these trees were going to go, and there was, be, there, down the street, they would, um, mark with a piece of paint like an X or something like that on the curb where they the team was supposed to come and plant the trees. But he realized that a lot of a lot of them were going to end up right in front of the entrance yep. of some of these buildings. And he just didn't think that was right. So one night he went through and he moved the mark. He got his own paint and he moved the marks for a lot of the trees so that they wouldn't end up right in front of the entrance of the building. So, I mean, that just shows you how committed he was and how much he loved and had a vision for what he wanted Market Street to look like. And you're right. He he faced a little, he told me, you know, faced a lot of resistance from, you know, some of these owners who didn't want to, who couldn't see at first why, you know, you might want to have your uh, sign in a different way or how it should coordinate with the rest of the street, but he persisted. And, you know, obviously Market Street is one of the prettiest streets, um, you know, obviously in New York, but in the country, I mean, that, that's the whole, the whole idea for the film I did on Main Street Rising was based on the success that, Norman and Tom and, and Virginia Wright and all these other people had in creating downtown Corny Market Street, that main street, and how it was used across the country to mm -hmm. revitalize downtowns at a time when a lot of people were just destroying their architecture. And it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. The, um, you know, the, the image on the screen right now is, is, of course, where the Rockwell would move. It's the old city hall. And um, you know, when you visit, uh, you know, Corning residents will know that um, you know, on, on either side of Market Street, you know, the back side of the Market Street buildings um, are um, uh, typically are parking lots today. Um, and the, it, can, it can't, be, can't be overstated how much the concerns of downtowns uh, at the time, and maybe it still consists, exists today, people were worried about parking. Well, I can't go to shopping downtown because I can't park. And the threat of the mall uh, weighed heavily in everybody's mind, certain, and um, the, the, which the mall had been recently built and was considered you know, to be a tremendous threat and proved to be threats to many downtowns. So the ad idea that you had to have parking adjo adjoining the shopping was very, very important. So a lot of beautiful buildings were lost off of Market Street, you know, on the backside of Market Street to make way for those parking lots that are there today. And of course, the Rockwell, the old city hall was absolute prime candidate. You know, this is, um, if it, there, there aren't any other Victorian buildings along that side, you know, along that stretch of the Denison Parkway. They're, they're all gone now. And, um, and, and so creating parking was a huge deal. So this picture is from the city hall days and you can see um, Denison Parkway was, it was, I think it was Erie Avenue or I think it was Erie Avenue. Um, and you can see the railroad track. So this was not a pretty part of town. Um, and, um, and this building was not, which we now consider to be charming and beautiful was not necessarily considered to be pretty either. And, um, there was a, um, I just recently came across this quote um, and uh, a gentleman named Dr. Herb Wisby said, quote, a group of local citizens are interested in preserving the city hall, the image we're looking at here. Perhaps it should be preserved as a memorial to the bad taste of the late Victorian period. It is difficult to see what function it could serve that would make the expense of preserving it economically feasible. And this gentleman, was the board member of the Shimon County Historical Society. 
So um, local historians um, were, uh, it, it wasn't, a, it, you know, so this is, this is the context that Norman Mintz is stepping into and uh, the preservationists of the time are stepping into. And, um, uh, and so the, of course, the building was sold for a dollar um, uh, to uh, Corning Incorporated, who then uh, invested in the restoration of it and turning it into, into, uh, into the museum. I didn't know that. I didn't know that the building was sold for a dollar to them. It's the first time I've heard that. That's, you know, and that clip that we just showed too had the lease uh, in at least Johnson Smith. And she, um, she's one of the loveliest people I've ever met. And she, and talk about being influenced and um, mentored in some ways. I think, I think she'd be okay with me saying that by somebody like Norman Mintz, um, who loved architecture. Um, I mean, he, and he uh, tells a story about how he loved it his entire life. And he, he, he was pushing against even when he was down in, um, in New York, I think, I believe he, he was born in Queens. Um, some of his first jobs were he, he pushed against resistance and saving these old buildings, but he knew that that it was something that uh, that would work. And I think he wrote, if I remember right, he wrote a book called um, Cities Back from the Edge years mm -hmm. ago back that, that talked about cities and he used Corning as an example of how cities could be revitalized by using their architecture. And you're right, at the time, nobody was nobody was doing that. Um, and, and that's why people did, like Elisa, no, people were keeping their eye on Corning to see if it was su succeed. And, um, and that's what we try to talk about in that film, The Main Street Rising. And Norman really uh, carries the narration in many ways of that because it's really his story about how that example was then used uh, across the country to, to revitalize downtowns. And, and his, uh, you know, his influence, can, even in creating the, I'm sorry, I don't live in Corning, is it called Sparkle now, yep. the, the celebration? That was originally his idea. Uh, he, wanted, he wanted to get people together downtown in Corning and Sparkle. He tells a great story in the Main Street film about the first time he was worried that people weren't gonna start showing up and it was getting late and nobody was showing up and he was going to sell roasted chestnuts, I believe. Yep. <laughs> and, and right around the time that it was supposed to start, it started snowing. And, uh, and then he knew that this, this was something that was going to work. And uh, what was that uh, 40 some, some years ago, um, just, just a neat guy and an amazing, amazing legacy, obviously. Um, a, a little, uh, known fact is that the um, you know it, it's it's public knowledge that I'll start with things that are known facts. So it's it's not unusual for a not-for-profit like the Rockwell Museum to um, have corporate support and uh, you know grant funding support to make make a go of it to to get off the ground and get started and you know restore the building, etc. Um, what what's what's less known is that. Um, um, through the uh, Marcus Restoration Agency, um, tenants were um, attracted to come to Corning um, and, and uh, through local de uh, development agency as well. And with very attractive translate, you know, dollar a year kind of rents to, to occupy these newly restored storefronts. And, um, and so the early years of, of um, of Market Street um, had businesses that were essentially destination businesses um, that um, that really got you know demonstrated. It was like proof of concept that demonstrated the vibrancy uh, that a Main Street could be. And of course, you know that doesn't work forever. You 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 attract people there, and then they got to make it on their own. And and sure enough, um, you know um, it worked. It worked, and so that idea of like Norman Mintz is like, if, you know, you make chestnuts during the holidays on the street, right? That's that's you know that's the just like you know the you know live music in a bar, you know, it's the two that go hand in hand. Um, uh, it, it took a lot of willpower and and vision to to pull it off. Yeah, well, and it's one of the it's one of my favorite parts of, of doing these films and it always renews my faith in humanity is the people I get to interview. And this, this film particularly, it, it just a collection of people 
who right from the beginning before the flood through the flood and then afterwards were driven to save this city from what they knew could, could have could have many ways just driven a lot of people out of town now obviously corning being there corning uh glass and then corning is, is it can't be understated that the influence that they had um but leadership the leadership they had first with you know with Amo and with Thomas and then bringing in somebody like uh, Norman Mintz and then sticking with him when I think it was in many ways really tough um, but and believing in him and you know him being the right personality at the right time uh, is, is something that I think a lot of people will and, and also you can't discount the people like Ginny Wright and the, the group of people who had this who had started this vision before the flood um, mm. these are all people that uh, that had a hand and and made sure that uh, the ideas that Norman had and the ideas that it kind of called together. Um, it's a, it's a it's a really neat story. Um, and uh, whenever I do try to approach films like this, it's like I said before, I try to approach it with looking for how things uh, were either a defining moment in many ways. And in, and for both Elmira and Corning, I believe uh, people still believe you know the flood is seventy two will always be one of those moments of of definition. You know, there's certainly a generation, I'm, I'm part of that generation that measures time before the flood and after the flood. Yeah, yeah. I don't uh, know. Um, go ahead. No, go on, Brian. Oh, I was going to, I, I wasn't sure if Kate was, uh, I'm sure she's still there, if she had gotten any questions she wanted to um, run by us or. Wow, great timing, Brian. It's like we, it's like we practiced. <laughs> it's like we've been planning this all along. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, one thing that um, I do have a couple of questions coming in from other folks. I have actually a couple that um, I want to make sure that we have you guys talk about, but um, I'm, you might have mentioned this somewhere, uh, but can you just tell us what Norman Mintz's relationship was to Corning, how he ended up here? Um, I'm not sure if I got that story. Well, if I remember right, it was he... Uh, had, he saw, uh, and Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm trying to remember from my film. I think that he saw, he was in New York and saw either an ad where they were looking for a city type planning person. Okay. And, and, yep. and, he, and he answered kind of call and, and he okay. said, um, it looks like I'm going to go to Corning. I don't think he had ever been here before <laughs> Okay. or knew anything about it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it was, it was definitely the, the, that pre-flood vision led by mm -hmm. the local preservationists, including Tom Buechner and Jenny, uh, Jenny Wright, that um, uh, we, we have to do this. And so I'm sure Tom found a little bit of money somewhere in, in, in a, one of the corporate budgets to, geez, you know, could we fund this position? Could we bring this guy to town? And so, uh, and, and of course, like, you know, it's a little bit, it's like the music man, right? It's like Tom Buechner, uh, uh, Norman Mintz comes to town and just, you know, get out of the way because some, something's going to happen. <laughs> so he, they were able to uh, start working with him before the flood. And so he was already, uh, okay, great. That's, you know, we wanted to just kind of give a good rundown of like who the major players were involved before. And I wasn't sure if all of that carried over after, but that's great that we had not only our local crew, but also this um, incredible, you know, visionary that was there before and was able to pick up after. That's, that's amazing. Um, thank you. Um, I think the, um, uh, for me, the, uh, I guess I'll put it this way. My, my flood story. That's my next uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> my, my flood story was, uh, I was 12 years old. I was, uh, you know, recently graduated from what was then called junior high school. I was looking forward to going to high school the next year. And, um, um, it, it, you know, the, uh, it, it's, it's, it's required watching for everyone to look at Brian's film about this because it captures it so beautifully. It's just rained and rained and rained in, it, it, towards the end of June. And just, um, it, you know, certainly uh, something I'd never experienced, that kind of rain, that consistent rain. And our street, Elmira, that I grew up on, ended up at the, you know, went down to the river and there's a dike at the end of the street uh, protecting the, you know, the neighborhood from the river. And the night before the flood, it's within inches of the top of the dike and it's raining like hell. 
And, and you know, the idea that it's not going to flood, it, you know, people are saying, oh, it's not gonna flood, it's not gonna flood. Um, um, my parents were at a party of, uh, that evening with local business people who are convincing each other that it's not going to flood. Um, but there was one, and, and, and there was one, but there, and so I'm, I'm at home with my sister, babysitting my sister, and it's, and I, I walk, we go, we get on the dike and walk along the dike, and it's like, my God, it's, it's inches away. It's, it's just powerfully devastating. Houses are floating down the river. And um, I go into the house, and the phone rings, and it's um, Tommy Hilfinger. And, and Tommy, uh, Tommy's, first store people's place was in the basement of the of the building that my dad and Elmira um on Maine and Gray and um and my dad's office is on the second floor and he's calling my dad looking to get a key to my dad's office because he and his partner Larry want to pull all the inventory out of the basement and take it up the stairs to protect it from the flood and so I um I was you know in those days of course you know your, your parents leave the phone number of the people whose party they're going to. And so I called there and, and, and my dad and Tommy connected and my dad let him into the office. And, and then, so the, all the inventory is sitting at drafting tables in a ar architect's office that evening. And um, within, um, it felt like within a few days, uh, they had opened up a temporary store um, over on College Avenue in Elmira, which had not been flooded. And um, it seemed like the only place you could get clothing in Elmira for about two weeks was People's Place. And so they're like, you know, everyone's wearing bell bottoms suddenly. <laughs> yeah, there's some great, uh, that, that, that's definitely a passage in Brian's film too about um, how that was kind of the only place and that they, they did travel to get more inventory too because people had obviously lost everything. Um, so, but it's amazing that, you know, you, you have that role in that story, Rob, of being the one to answer the phone to make sure the inventory <laughs> got upstairs. Um, Brian, I know that you, uh, you know, you didn't obviously grew up in the, right in this area, the Corning Elmira area, but I know you have a little bit of a personal connection too. Um, if you want to share your. Not as story. exciting as, as Rob's obviously, but I was, <laughs> I was, um, I was about to turn 10 years old. Uh, we, and, uh, you know, it was in Binghamton. I was actually living in Port Dickinson, which is right, you know, just over the city city line. And I there was a um, a dike behind our house, a man-made uh, dike through, along the Shenango River. Um, years ago, I did a film called the 1935 flood, and so actually that dike was built to protect uh, Port Dickinson from the, the flood waters of the Shenango River. But anyways, I remember standing on this dike when it was raining and raining in June, and the waters were rising. Now it didn't um it didn't flood in Binghamton very badly at all at that time, mostly because of these dikes and these flood walls that were built after the 1935 flood. But it just so happened to be that that was the summer and right after, not long after the flood, was when my family drove from Binghamton to Florida. And we drove down Route 81. And if people will know that um, Scranton, wilkes Bear, a lot of other uh, cities along that way were also devastated by uh, Agnes the way it came up through. And um, I do remember the, us having to take detours and be diverted around and seeing uh, devastation along the route. And, and it taken a, a long time, especially to get through Pennsylvania because mm -hmm. of that. Um, you know, and at the time I, you know, I was a nine, 10 year old kid. So I, I didn't, didn't register until I started working on this film and, uh, and started looking at some of the photographs from Wilkes Barre and Scranton, which were um, and it, my son now goes to Wilkes University in Wilkes-Barre, and so every time I'm down there, you can see the flood walls are there, and um, they, they actually have a, a big celebration, a celebration memory plan of um, the 50th anniversary of the flood, flood in that area. Um, I do want to answer a question that came in like right away while we're, you know, while you guys were chatting about the clips and everything for everybody, um, you know, where can people watch the film in its entirety? And it is uh, something that through WSKG, you can always um, pay to watch it, but in honor of the anniversary and doing this program, um, Brian has made it available uh, from out behind the paywall. So in the follow-up email for everybody who's on right now, um, you will get a link to uh, that film as well as Main Street Rising. So since they're kind of sister films, so you'll be able to watch it. 
Anything to add, Brian? That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. You're right. I, I've always considered these those two sister films. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a, uh, it, you know, it, I, <laughs> the second one certainly tells Norman's story, but I, it, and it tells the story of the, of the influence of Corning. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the film is, is excellent. We've actually been playing it um, at the Rockwell Museum for anybody who um, is local but hasn't visited lately. Um, we have a small uh, exhibit with some of the photographs that are in our presentation here. Um, since the flood was really impactful to the Rockwell, um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about that too. But uh, the film has been playing in that small exhibition. Um, and I have recurring nightmares about like, waves and floodwaters so I've watched it many times and um you know I it's clear that I've dedicated to my work because I've watched this film about a flood several times now I always think one of the most haunting parts of it is the uh the aerial footage I think it's of Elmira mm -hmm. when I was when I was editing and I, I remember the, I was editing that uh that scene late at night and I don't know how it came to me because it, it was silent film it was just you know footage of I thought, wow, it'd be really creepy if I added a sound effect of a helicopter to it. And I did, and I have to admit it, to, it was probably one of the best moves I've ever, I don't get a lot of them, but that was a pretty good one. Man, yeah, and I'll just scroll through some of these pictures too for um, those who haven't had a chance to watch the film, um, some of this, you know, um, what the flood waters looked like in Corning. So uh, this must be the bridge kind of going towards the glass museum. Um, if you're coming down from Cedar Street Hill. Um, and then this is an aerial shot of Corning with um, Corning headquarters and the, the bridges here. Yeah, and, and that oh, picture gosh. too, if you look at the bottom and the, the bottom right with the cars on the bridge there, mm -hmm. just uh, lined up <laughs> with obviously nowhere to go. Um, that always struck me in that photograph and the houses to the, to the left, um, mm -hmm. up to the roof. I mean, that really illustrates how, how deep the water was just really chilling. Um, okay, but I won't, I won't keep our screen up on that because that's hard to look at for a long time. <laughs> but yes, um, when we were kind of reviewing our, our slides beforehand, I know Rob, this one really struck you. Um, so you talked a little bit about how the Rockwell's first, and I actually have a question about the Rockwell collection as well. Um, but the Rockwell Museum's kind of first more permanent home was in the, the hotel. Um, and then we were able to move into the renovated city hall. Um, and so, you know, the city hall building was very, had fallen from its glory days before the flood. Um, and then it seems like that the flood kind of created an opportunity to, uh, you know, provide a new home for, for the collection. Is there yeah, a little it, bit more to speak to? Yeah, um, it, it, this, this picture really captures it. So this is um, you can see the, the parking sign there is a, is a hint, uh, the yellow, yellow and brown parking sign um, is a hint that uh, this is taken uh, w well into the restoration of Market Street because those are the, the they marked, you know, they designed all the, you know, historically appropriate signage, et cetera. And that's, an, that's evidence of that. So this is probably 74, 75. And um, and this building was just this, you know, by the city hall had moved to the new, um, you know, over by the library, um, you know, the vibrant new location. This is, you know, this is just like abandoned property. And um, I was going to ask, oh, it was empty at the time yeah. of this. Okay. But at the time of this picture, it was empty, I, I believe. And, um, and, and I remember I used to, um, carpool to you know on Saturdays to go on a ski bus and we would get picked up in front of the building here and it felt like a haunted castle <laughs> you know just like you know what in the hell are you going to do with this thing yeah. and uh because it was so big and you know and that's you know it's, and many times it's it, it's it's uh, I'm, I'm the board of the museum association of new york and museums find themselves in buildings like this you know there's no obvious uh thing for it to become and, uh, and it, it proved to be, you know, an exceptionally great home for, for the Rockwell. But it, it was a leap of faith. You know, do you, if you stood 100 people in the parking lot and asked them, what do you do with this building? A reasonable number would say, you know, tear the damn thing down. Uh, well, and I, I should mention, fittingly, 80% of the interviews that were done for this film were done 
in the Rockwell Museum. <laughs> that's the, that's telling, isn't it? And of course, there was a you know you could see the doors on the lower left. That was the fire station. Uh, this is where the jail was. This is where you know the uh, administrative offices were for the city hall. There was even a brass pole um, from the second floor where the firemen slept down into the fire station. And there's a remnant. If you go in the gift shop of the Rockwell, you can still see the the evidence of it in the ceiling where the where the hole in the ceiling was for the brass pole. Oh, that's great. Um, you know, it's, it's like a pure 19th century. This is this is you know the the center of the municipality. Yeah, for um, anyone who isn't familiar uh, with some of the work that we do, the Elise Johnson Smith, who's featured in the last clip, um, actually worked with our education team, you know, many years ago to develop an architecture tour. Um, so this thread of the architecture of Corning is uh, even something that's. Um, it's an architecture tour for students, for elementary school students, not for adults. So it's something that's crystallized down and passed on to our next generation. Um, and they come into the Rockwell Museum and they look at the uh, hole in the ceiling that used to be where the pole would come down. Um, so it's such a great resource. Um, yeah, so. Um, if, if we go to the other slide that showed the old hotel and uh, you know the center wave where the uh, bridge to the museum is the one with flood water or no no the uh, <laughs> just the street shot i think it's one more that one it was flood water okay <laughs> so so there's the baron Stuben hotel so that was the hotel in corning you know prior to the flood um and that's and the, and then the second floor of that building is where the uh, the first home of the rockwell museum was and um and it was so, um, it, it can't be, it made such an impression. So the Glass Museum is a, is a you know, world famous to, tourist attraction. It's a, you know, an incredible, it's always been an incredible museum, but it's a decorative arts museum. You know, it's, it's objects. Um, and, and, um, and to have the Rockwell open, in Corning, you know, modest little Corning, you know, the, the uh, and it's a painting gallery, it's an art museum. Yeah. It was, it was transformative. And it basically, they transformed the second floor of the, of the old hotel into a, like a white box. It was like a white wall gallery kind of feel uh, for a reasonable uh, amount of it. And, and that added to the drama of it. It just, it, you know, I guess it, from my modern perspective, it was like you, you stepped into a New York, you know, New York City art museum, art gallery. And, um, and it really caught everybody's attention. It's, it, what's the theme here is that, you know, Norman Mintz sees a restored street where everyone else sees derelict buildings. Um, uh, Tom Beekner imagines an art museum coming from the paintings that are hanging in the local department store, you know, uh, that we have dust gathering on them. Um, these, um, the contemporary architects who took advantage of urban renewal dollars that were so readily available, and they built a beautiful library and a beautiful city hall and a beautiful modern hotel. You know, I'm, there's nothing wrong with those structures. They're actually outstanding examples of that, that period of time in architecture and the housing development beyond there is those are beautiful buildings. Um, individuals imagining what could be when other people just absolutely couldn't see it. And, and I, I, I think the, of all the things that happened, the kind of magic trick of the Rockwell Museum coming <laughs> from this moment is, you know, is, is truly stunning. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, Rob, I just want to ask a quick question. Did, 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 do you think people knew uh, people in Corning who had been through this and were watching kind of this resurrection, did they know something special was was kind of going on? That's an excellent question. I think that's another film you need to make. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think a lot of it. Um, well, let's let's look at the picture on the screen. So um, the story continues. So what are we looking at beyond the hotel? That's, that, that's, um, that's an old factory that made Pyrex. 
the the water there there was no sense of the riverfront in Corning, New York. The riverfront was a string of factory buildings, and it was industrial, and it was uh, you know it was humming with activity that was you know it was very vibrant. Um, I'll I'll use this picture to paint that even more vividly. Uh, we talked about you know bars on Market Street. The you would see at lunchtime. You know Connie was talking about that in the film. Um, I remember people, uh, the, um, there's, a, um, there's a, a job in the factory called a carrion boy. And a carrion boy back in the day was some boy, you know, uh, child labor boy um, doing the lowest level job in the, in, the, in the factory. Well, carrion boy was actually a, a job title. And they, you know, they're basically moving uh, hot glass from point A to point B in, in a production line. And, um, they'd be sent over to Market Street with the stainless steel buckets used to cool the tools and you'd fill them up with beer. And you see these guys like, you know, 40 year old guys with two buckets of beer walking from Market Street over to the factory. And, you know, this is like a 19th century practice going on in, you know, in 1980, I remember it in 1980. Um, so these were factory buildings along the, along the riverfront. The, the living in Corning did not involve a sense of the river other than you're on this endless um, you know, traffic jam trying to get across the river on a two lane bridge to get over to the other side. Um, all those, so in terms of visioning what could be, when those factories left town, Corning Incorporated built their headquarters there in Riverfront Park, the, the Centennial Park, where the, mar where the farmer's market is today. Nobody looked at, that, the, that piece of real estate and imagined architecture that would embrace the, the waterfront as, as it does today. Um, and, and, and the historic preservationists were throwing, laying down in front of the bulldozers, bulldozers to save the pedestrian bridge. You know, that's in recent memory that that took place. So the, you know, all of the, the sort of majestic beauty of Corning, downtown Corning is, is the work comes from people who imagined what could be when others could not. I was thinking when you asked that question, Brian, that we, um, looking at my attendees here, have some folks that I know, and I'm wondering if there are people who, you know, have been in the area throughout all this, and I would love them to write in the chat whether or not it was something that they realized was happening while it was happening. Um, and everybody is welcome to drop your questions into the Q&A box as well. I have one that I'm going to get to next, but um, that also just sparked a question, um, which again, some people who are local might know the answer, um, but I certainly don't. Have. So, you know, from the point of cleanup from the flood, you know, everything's kind of cleaned up and livable again, you know, how, how, what was the time span of the um, kind of culmination of the successful uh, revitalization of the downtown. How, what was it like decades or, you know, how long did it take? I mean, I, I'll, I'll jump in the, um, so the flood was in 72 and um, the, there was a huge, there was a huge effort in, in the country around the bicentennial. So 1976, and that became um, the goal the goal line for a lot of projects to be done and ready, and so that's that was the um, the um, the the all the civic spaces, the new hotel, all of that. That was we we need to be have that open by 1976. So that's that's four years. That's an unbelievable transformation of four years. Um, and similarly, um, uh, the Rockwell Museum um, uh, in, its, in its first manifestation was 1976. Um, I, I'm pretty sure, um, I maybe have my history wrong there a little bit, but the idea was it's got to be ready for the bicentennial. And, um, and, and I think this, um, with the bicentennial also you know, historically sparked a tremendous interest in local history. So if you look at New York State museums, there's a spike in history museums, you know, that, that happens around the, around the bicentennial. People are waking up, waking up to it. And of course, the historic preservationists in Corning um, 
you know, it, it did a tremendous job um, um, in, in along that way in terms of the the museum presence in town for you know uh, history museums as well. Yeah, I know what I just a couple of years. When I interviewed um, Norman, I, he was here for a while. I mean, he he made I remember he said he made lifelong friends. You know, lived here as a city planner a bit for a while, and I I, I got the feeling that he was here. You know, for at least three or four years, maybe longer. Um, well, he was working when I moved to Corning after college in 1980. He was a very much a vibrant uh, presence. Um, was still here. Okay. Oh yeah, in the early 80s, he was he was here and and um, you know fighting the fight. It with what didn't end. You know, the, all those buildings didn't get done at once. It was there were still projects underway. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I wasn't I wasn't here. I wasn't around. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm sure this is a question that's on everybody's mind, but uh, we have one question that is to Rob, do you know which building on Market Street has the facade that was relocated from Addison? I, I could, I, I don't know it off the top of my head. I, somehow we'll need to share this out to the group. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could walk down Market Street and pick okay. it out. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. I'm yeah. really, really it's a wooden. It, the secret is it's a wooden facade. I think it's in the West End. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that maybe the apothecary, uh, if it's a store a shop was there, I, 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 at any rate, I, I could, I'll point it out. <laughs> I should have done my homework better. <laughs> That's all right. The story is good, you know, in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Another question is, um, you know, the Corning Museum of Glass, I'm wondering about, it was still, pretty much in its infancy, right? When this happened, it was, it was pretty new. Um, mm -hmm. And the museum community, the way that you said the museum community got involved in that, um, the efforts to preserve things. I wonder about whether that kind of uh, bolstered like the, the profile of the Corning Museum of Glass if it became known to the museum community in a way that like maybe it wouldn't have. Yeah, that's that's a really excellent um, um, observation. The yeah, so the museum opened in '51, and the flood is in '72. So it's it's a 21 year old mm -hmm. institution. Yeah. Um, you know, there was no such thing as a, a a museum of that type when and oh, Tom Beekner, who we're talking about glowingly here. Well, Tom was the founding director of the Corning Museum of Glass and was hired to create that collection when he was 29 years old. Um, so. You know, he's a young man um, and, um, uh, you know, creates this thing working side by side with um, Arthur Houghton uh, of, the, of the Houghton Corning family. And, um, and it's, it is a young museum when the flood hits. And, um, and uh, what the, the, the historic preservation efforts that took place, the conservation efforts that took place there were uh, certainly got people's attention uh, and helped to uh, elevate the museum's profile in the museum community. But more importantly, it was going back to the earlier comments, um, it, it was that, that beacon of hope mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. a devastated, that summer of 72, mm -hmm. it was just ugly. Mm -hmm. the, everything smelled of flood mud, the dust was in the air, the mm -hmm. people, uh, Brian's film portrays, people were living in FEMA trailers and, and lived in them for years. There's like trailer parks of FEMA trailers. I mean, it, it's like, you know, you look at, you know, modern day news footage of floods and hurricanes. That's what it felt like here. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. but yes, it secured the, uh, help to bolster the reputation of the, of the museum. I, 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 I feel compelled to tell the, uh, very briefly, the story of how the director of the Corning Museum of Glass learned about the flood. Um, so the director at the time was um, in uh, Afghanistan on uh, an archeological trip, um, a research trip uh, funded by the museum, uh, Bob Brill. And the deputy director of the museum who was at home and, and was here for the flood was a gentleman named Paul Perot, a very um, uh, important figure in the museum community. Um, and Paul has to tell Bob Brill, the flood has happened. So he writes a telegram. You can't pick up a phone and call Afghanistan. Um, and he writes, and I don't, you don't even know he could pick up the phone at all. 
at, at the time of the flood because of the city's been cut off. So he sends a telegram. And of course, telegrams you pay by the, by the letter. And so he writes a very ec economy, uh, ec uh, economical telegram, which read, museum destroyed, return immediately. <laughs> And so Bob told the story of getting this telegram. He said, all I can imagine was a meteorite fell out of the sky and, you know, devastated the museum. And it, it took him days and days to actually get, to get the whole picture of what had happened because he was in this remote part of, of the world. Um, but, uh, you know, note to future, uh, muse, you know, emergency management people, be more detailed in your telegram. <laughs> It's a museum person's absolute worst nightmare, right? I mean, our collections, are, yeah, just, yeah. Um, but let me ask the questions that other folks have here. Um, this is a great question. Um, if the revitalization team were around today, what do you think they would be working on now? Is there still more to be done in, in downtown Corning or in our in Corning in general, I guess? That's an interesting question. You know, it's, it's, it's a, in a place now where so much great work has been done. And, um, you know, the, it, it's, it, it, maybe the best answer to that is, is that, well, what is the restoration of, of Market Street and what is the restoration of the city hall turning it to the Rockwell Museum? You know, anybody who bought, bought an old house and fixed it up knows that the next big project is repairing it and keeping it up to date. You know, it's, it's old buildings need lots of love. And that's, that's also true for the 1970s architecture that was built. You know, some of those buildings are actually historically important. They're past that where here we are at the 50 year mark or coming up on the 50 year mark where they could be landmarked and, and some of them deserve to be. And, and they need tender love and care too. Um, so you know, now we're in a period of preserving all the good work that has been done and, um, and, and making sure it's, it's, uh, it continues. Yeah, we certainly know about the upkeep at the Rockwell Museum. <laughs> so, um, never ends. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, our that building, this old city hall building was built in 1893. Um, so it has quite, has had quite a life and having a modern, you know, museum in a building that old is, we could have a whole different lecture about that. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, um, this might be our last uh, question, and but then of course, you know, if you guys have anything to add after, um, but the last question is, because um, we are just about time, uh, is there an estimate of, of how much of the collections museum was damaged beyond restoration uh, from the flood and um, how many years after the flood was the museum continuing to do restoration repair on collection objects? Um. I, I don't know off the top of my head the percentage that was was lost. It was a relatively low percentage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Corning Museum of Glass says the conservation staff, con what is a conservator in, in the Glass Museum? They 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 clean and repair glass. You know, so you, uh, and sometimes you acquire objects that have been poorly repaired and you take them apart and put them back together again. They're master three dimensional puzzle makers. You know, a broken object can be reassembled and, and glued back together and look like it's never been broken. Um, so um, that conservation work continues to this very day. There are, there are objects in the collection that um, may have been restored uh, post flood and they weren't restored, you know, as well or conserved as well as they could be. So they're, uh, they're active projects today in the conservation lab of, of dealing with flood dam damaged objects. So uh, 50 years later, uh, that work continues. There's um, a piece in the film too, maybe Brian can speak to a little bit more that um, there were people who came from other museums just specific. So it wasn't um, only the, you know, we talked about the museum community reaching out, but it was phys people physically traveled here to help with that restoration and conservation process. Yeah, very much so. And then- right. And it really, um, um, go on, Brian. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think there's a clip in the film that actually that crew that I talked about earlier uh, filmed of students who helped, uh, especially with some of, if I remember right, they used, uh, was it Tom's pool? 
if I remember right, to there was some of the books they had to be like laid in water or something like that so they could yep. get the butt off and things like that. Um, and then so there were people from all over who helped do that process. And I think there's a clip in the film of this girl who was interviewed by that group talking about the process of trying to uh, save some of those books that he talked about that were basically mud covered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and when you talk about the, you know, the, the Corning Museum of Glasses, um, um, reputation, if you will. Uh, you know, a lot of those students, uh, that was a, it was a pretty am- amazing summer in Corning. You know, all of this uh, firepower of uh, highly skilled museum professionals coming together in Corning, and it was, you know, uh, people well into the career and, students, uh, you know, just starting. And uh, all, all of them, you know, remember that, that period of time and the profound um, uh, experience of working in Corning in that summer of 72. Great, thank you. I will repeat where the film can be viewed. <laughs> um, we will send a link to this film and to um, Brian's film, Main Street Rising, in your follow-up email that you received from the museum tomorrow. And those films are available to watch free of charge um, for a limited time in honor of this program today. So look for that email tomorrow. And if um, if you don't see it or you miss it or anything like that, just reach out to anyone at the Rockwell Museum. Um, maybe my colleague can drop uh, her and my email in the chat so that uh, people have it top of mind. Um, well, thank you both so much. I mean, I, I know that I knew this was going to be a great conversation and, um, you know, I, I appreciate the work both of you have done to keep this history alive. Uh, it's very important. And like you were saying, Rob, the Rockwell Museum, we were very grateful to all the people who were invested and involved because it was like a magic trick. All of a sudden there was this <laughs> great museum that came out of it. So uh, thank you both so much. Thank you. It's a, ple- it's a pleasure. And Brian, thank you for your excellent work. Oh, thank you. I, and I, honestly, 10 years later, I wish I had interviewed you for the film. <laughs> uh, uh, you would have been a great addition, but it would have been fun uh, chatting with you today. It's been great. Well, we have a recording of this uh, program, so it could just be a little companion piece, right? <laughs> and we sure. look forward to uh, Brian's next film as well. I would love to hear more about that sometime. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Um, and I will be happy to talk to you next time. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much.